Okay, you all good? Let's do it. Hello and welcome to the B2C Lead Generation Podcast. And today we have Ben Hellyar joining us to look at publishing in lead gen. How are you doing, Ben? Very well, Daniel. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Good to see you again. So I was thinking about whether we should um, should admit this, but I thought it would come inevitably that we have recorded this podcast about three months ago now, and due to poor connection issues, we unfortunately couldn't use it. But the good news is, because it's been a while, I've kind of forgotten, you know, what a lot of the things we discussed, so it's going to be feel like we're approaching it fresh. But um, yeah, it was really good, so we want to make sure we, we had you back to actually discuss these things. So uh, thanks for coming again. No, really appreciate it, mate. Anytime. So, um, you know, Ben, you've got tons of experience in the marketing, digital marketing industry, um, and you're the general manager of NetRev. Um, to kind of get us up and running again, can you give us a little intro into what NetRev do, what you guys do, and the kind of things you work on? Yeah, absolutely. So NetRev own and operate a group of different marketplaces in the UK that are all centric around consumer savings. So our flagship is gogroupie.com. It's got about 500 different sellers, about 8,000 different products online that users can come through and buy from at any time. We've also got discount experts and go group in Ireland um, <coughs> in our stable house. About two years ago, we started looking at our uh, companies and our reach and realized that, hang on a minute, what, we, what we're doing here is sales and marketing for a lot of other businesses. So can we use our reach and our brands to drive leads, sales, brand for other companies? So we've been doing that now for the past two years, and it's gone from pillar to post in terms of strength. It's growing, changing every day. And as long as a brand has something that's around consumer saving, we can drive traffic to them. Just sort of like, I want to focus in from the perspective of brands and lead buyers. Um, So, you know, who's your kind of ideal kind of client, would you say? Difficult question. It's got to be someone that's really looking for our user, I suppose. Like We're a very data-centric business. Everything that we do relies on the fact that we carve up the database, we carve up our exposures, and we look at how we can use our digital assets best to profit the partners that we work with. So it might not be that everyone, you know, it's not cookie-cutter stuff. It doesn't fit, one size fits all. This D2C evolution that we're seeing at the moment is, is big. Brands wants to interact with consumers directly. Every company out there that you can think of is entering that market. I noticed yesterday Coca-Cola have just come in with their uh, direct consumer offering. Really interesting. But they'll miss it with our users if there's not a discount and saving there. And for us, that's, that's the real key thing. You have to have a great message for the users and we will then drive it and make it convert. What's... Um... So what's the like user journey of what happens when someone goes to um, Google Group, Go Group your, your biggest uh, asset that you drive traffic to, I guess? So for us, email is still our number one driver of traffic. Hmm. It's where we get most of engagement. It's the bread and butter of what we do. Simon, you've signed up because maybe you've seen an iPad at a great price or we're selling a holiday at a fantastic price. But once we've got you on that list, we start understanding and personalizing the messaging that's coming to you because we understand your behaviors. And that's the great thing about e-commerce. It allows you to understand a hell of a lot about your users. You know what they're interested in. You know what they're purchasing. You know the seasonality of what they're purchasing as well and what they might be clicking on. And you can use that data to make sure that you're presenting great branded offers and partner offers that are applicable to that user. So yet again, it's not one size fits all. Um, So it might be that, Daniel, you're seeing things from Coca-Cola. Simon, maybe you're seeing things from Red Bull. It's that kind of attitude that we have towards things. And in terms of your question, I cannot remember what you asked. No, I can't either, but I like your answer. Slab it on. um, So, okay, that's pretty cool. So based on like the details that you have on the user and their previous behavior drives what you're actually going to be sending them. And so I'm assuming that like massively increases your open rates and the uh, sort of contacts that, you have with the actual user because it's like a wall garden that you've created right and that's why you can be so um uh efficient with your emailing to them i guess it's a closed user group exactly yeah. when you're when you're emailing you're, you're either in the list or you're not now anyone can sign up to the list but if you're not in the list you're not getting our emails so it is it's a closed group in that respect 
Now, we do have partnership opportunities outside of that walled garden. So maybe we have partners that want to feature on the homepage, want to feature in certain categories or whatever, and go for that more massive exposure. But that's looked at on a partner by partner basis because it's not going to it's not going to work for everyone. If you have a niche product, we would be foolish to try and take that to a mass market audience. The, the number one thing about us that makes our emails you know, more deliverable and our opening rates of 30% plus click through rates and engagement rates are some of the best in the industry is having very, very clean rules in our segmentations. So if you're not engaging with us, we drop you. And it's very much as simple as that. Then we have a CRM strategy that looks at your engagement and looks at, well, look, can we reactivate you? Are you maybe not interested in A? Are you more interested in B? So we, can we start that delivering that to you and re-engaging you in that manner? What do you use like one system to deliver emails or do you have several systems or how does it work? So everything that we do has been built in house and that's been really kind of core to how the company's you know, grown, become successful and it's very much our ambition to the future. We do use some third party software, but it's all completely customized to what we do. Mm. The segmentation and everything that we do data wise, that's all us. Yeah, makes sense. Because I think that's a, a lot of the problem that people have when they scale uh, volumes of data is like actually getting their emails delivered, don't they? Because they start, I guess it comes from not segmenting it because they just start sending like the same offer to absolutely everyone and it only suits like 20% of them. And so the engagement of all the others starts drop, dropping off. Whereas if you segment, it means that you can keep all of them engaged like all at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you just have to dive into the data continuously. You know, that what the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And you, you see a lot of that, the same newsletter from people into my inbox continuously. And then all of a sudden it ends up in the spam folder mm. just because I've stopped engaging with it. And so as numerous other users uh, with ourselves, we are on the data contis- consistently. We're not just looking at, you know, the conversion rate. We're looking at the engagement on, on, on the content we're presenting as well, because if the engagement isn't there. We have to change strategy. You can't keep delivering the same message because the ESPs that you're going through won't like it. And then, so what you, I, I know you run some lead gen stuff, but a lot of it is like the e-commerce side where you're driving it to the client's own site. Um, are you in control of the sort of the images and the page that the traffic's driven to? So you can say to clients, well, you, you know, you're driving it to your homepage on a site that's just not going to work. We need something that's going to be more conducive to a user converting. Yes, I think we're, we're an interesting case in the fact that we're involved in lead gen both ways. So on the, the e-commerce side for our own businesses, we are involved in lead gen consistently. We're always getting you know, new customers through. It's a big part of our strategy uh, and something that you know, we focus on really, really heavily. It's a core part of our play. And then on the other side of things, we enable you know, our customers to go out and be lead generated for other people. Mm. And that, I think, is difficult in terms of the conversations that you have with, with different brands and different partners some brands and partners are more receptive to creativity and, and doing things uh, more maybe in the go groupy way. Um, and other partners are not. Other partners are very much like, this is the way that we operate. Our brand guidelines say that we go to this page and this is all that we can do. So we do have to vary our approach to lead generation depending on the partner we're working with. The partners that are more flexible and use our years of experience, the brand messaging that perhaps we have, and the data, of course, that we sit on as well that enables us to know, look, 10% discount on this price point doesn't work. If you would offer something, I don't know, as a hook for free, um, or if you increase it to 15%, then we need increased conversion. Those are the partners that we see do better. Yeah. And do they understand that um, the ones that are doing the lead generation, obviously what that is, is the beginning of the relationship, right? And then it's sort of up to them to start engaging the user almost in the same way that you do with go group in the engagement that you have with the users. They, it's like a, they need to carry out the same process. Don't they effectively do you sort of like help them with that? Or is it. We, it's not part of our core offering, hmm. um, but it's definitely something that we advise on, you know, it, more so engaging on their end and, and talking to either their partners, engaging with people like yourself that have the experience that are actually part of that funnel driving as well, rather than ourselves, we're right at the top. We're at that kind of discovery level. 
Mm. But as part of our onboarding with our partners, especially that are new to this area, we're trying to educate them to the fact that you do have to have that continuous messaging. You do have to build up that relationship with your customers. Because much like you just pointed out there, Simon, with our e-commerce side, we're not just looking for that initial, are you going to sign up to our email campaign and engage with it? We're looking at what's the lifetime value of this customer and how can we consistently engage with them to make this a profitable lead for us? Excellent. So I just want to come back to that just to get it clear for people listening. Um, you talked about an importance of the offer and the messaging slide, but who's actually, is that like a, who's in charge of that messaging? Is, is it, is it just you or just like a conversation with the brands constantly? And does, are they saying, don't you send that? Like you've got, a, you know, is it a back and forth? Or? Uh, so it, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, I suppose. Okay. We have partners, like, like I said before, Daniel, that are very much, look, here's the offering. Here's the brand guidelines. This is what you're putting out. And if a partner's booking media with us as a straight out, look, I want to buy this slot, then we can advise. But nine times out of 10, it's just, this is what we're going to do. We report back on the results with a little bit of analysis suggesting what we would do next time. Big brands may or may not take that on board. Smaller companies that are more agile, more maybe entrepreneurial, that a lot of them are happier for us to take the lead on things. We've been doing this for 10 years in the e-commerce space. We've got data to know what works in all the different verticals that we operate in. And lots of them will take that and learn from it. We'll present it back to them, of course, for their feedback, their sign-off, any creative changes they would like to make. But we try and remain not in the driving seat ourselves, but very much sitting alongside them. It's a mistake that a lot of people buy leads and don't think about the journey of the lead have, isn't it? They go, they think the lead is like the success where it's, uh, it, it's actually the lead is the beginning of what could be success and that they need to start this engagement and start um, the relationship with that prospect, I guess. Um, Completely agree. I mean, you think about all the, the, the mail that comes through your door or into your inbox and things like this that maybe you've engaged with a, a brand once. If that's not personalized and doesn't, doesn't have an initial kind of connection with you, you stop engaging quite quickly. Mm. And it just becomes something that goes straight into the recycling bin. But if you can build that kind of relationship with the customer where maybe they've got a niche connection with you. So I don't know if you're a customer that's into fishing and you've signed up for a fishing magazine and they're sticking in that one vertical rather than all of a sudden chucking your cars and things, you're more likely to kind of connect with that brand. And that's why we've chose to stick in the savings space. Yeah. There was this kind of, I don't know, this greedy part of us, I suppose, that came in when we realized that we could do this. And you start thinking, well, hang on a minute, we could do partnerships with, with everyone and do anything. But you realize quite quickly that if it doesn't sit in your own brand guidelines and sit with your customer messaging, it's just not going to work. Yeah, you need a niche, don't you? Yeah, you, I think you just need a reason, right? What's your USP? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And what's, um, in terms of the lead gen that you guys carry out, because obviously you must do tons of it, right? Because you've got this database and you, I'm sure there's drop off small, but you have to continually grow it. And it's uh, more and more users that you're, um, clients can approach that you do on their behalf. But how how do you run your own lead gen? What's um, is it all on paid media? Is it organic or? God, we do it across a right mix of different things. Mm. Um, so we have partnerships, we do paid media, social, you name it, and and we're into it. I think that's really key these days. Is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You, you look at daily deals from, from years ago when it all first started, uh, we, we all try to grow in the same way from the same emailing lists and everything else. It doesn't work that way anymore. It's not one size fits all. Consumers' demands change so much and the way that we shop as individuals change so much. You know, Three years ago, four years ago, none of us would have thought about TikTok. Whereas now that's, some, that's a platform that people are looking at as a serious way to engage customers, generate customers, generate brand awareness. And this is just consistently going to change. You start thinking about voice search and the way that that's going to play a big part in our lives over the next few years. You've always got to be on your game and willing to change. I don't think you can ever sit back and say, right, we're masters in this one area and that's the way that we're going to stick because you will get left behind. Yeah, 100%. That's something that we see fairly often. So um, even from people who are licensed dateable, they'll just get stuck in like a channel because they're generating leads. 
What we always advise is that, um, okay, so imagine you're driving, I don't know, Facebook traffic or PPC, and um, you're doing really well out of it and you're um, not driving traffic anywhere else. We always say to people, okay, put 80% of your revenue into that and use the other 20% to start researching other types of traffic. Go to Twitter, go to TikTok, go to wherever um, and do that constantly. And at some point you'll find something that works and then you start redirecting the budget because you're exactly right. You just end up, something changes, the algorithm changes or you know, an ad that you had doesn't work anymore and suddenly all the traffic dries up. And I've seen it so many times happen actually. And it's just to do with them not diversifying where their audience is. And I, th- I think that's a really important point. You know, The reason that I think that we have thrived and grown to the way that we are is because they're, we are good at our core play. Like mm. you know, the email campaigns and everything else, that's, that's where we've kind of mastered. But like you say, there's 20% of budgets and everything else that goes into test things that you're you're not worried about making a mistake on trying something inevitably failing either taking it back to the drawing board and starting again learning from what's happened because even if it's completely gone wrong there's something there that you can learn from about why that went wrong or if it works great can we start growing that channel as another control channel for us Mm. so voice have you explored that then or is it something you're looking at in the future it's something that we're aware of, but nothing that we've spent any time in. Mm. I think it's, you know, for a lot of people, it's something that we need to be aware of. But I, to my knowledge, I don't know anyone that's cracked it. It's something that uh, Gary V goes on about, isn't it? I mean, he's been talking about it for like five years, going voices where everyone needs to go. Um, and you feel like it is, but it's, yeah, it's tough to understand like, okay, how would Go Groupie fit in it? And whether is there like an ad that you could run where someone says, I'm wanting offers on X, and then suddenly you could be the one that comes up? It'd be an interesting space to explore, definitely. Yeah, no, it, it may not be a space that works for us. It might be one of those experiments that we try at some point. It doesn't work, but we learn from when we go. That isn't part of our core play. Yeah. So um, let's say there's someone listening to this who's working for a brand, um, wants to buy some leads in. And they're looking at different, you know, at different areas of doing that. What would, what would you say to them is that makes you different from other forms of lead generation? What's the kind of the uh, the offer that you've got that makes, makes you stand out? Do you think? To be honest, Dan, it's it's where we're sitting in in the terms of, of advertising. When you've got an e-commerce user, they're in a buying mind frame already. They've come onto your platform to to browse, but nine times out of ten, it's actually to shop. They have a percent. Of, they have a reason. They want to purchase something so then when we're presenting them with a brand offer that's a really engaged user that's someone that's looking to buy and i think in that respect we're relatively unique i don't think there's a lot of people that are in the e-commerce space that are approaching partnerships and lead generation in the way that we are i know amazon do various things but nothing quite as similar as what we do there you know on amazon it's all about keeping inside the ecosystem Whereas one of the things that we've recognized is the fact that we don't just have to keep them in the ecosystem. We're really good at not just driving them for the partner, but also keeping that customer because we have a great relationship with them already. Do you see them as a competitor, Amazon, or? I think that would be a foolish word to use. <laughs> no, we'd love it. They're a competitor. I love you. <laughs> Look, I mean, they're, they're, they're the one to watch, right? They're, they're the behemoth in the market. In there, the- goes, there goes your voice search opportunity. Uh, well, look, I think if... Anyone you're with an Alexa? Voice, yeah, well, look, I think if you're going <laughs> to... set mine off. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're going to get into voice search, look, you've got to ride their technology. It's, it's as simple as that, really. Um, Amazon are someone that we're aware of. It's not somewhere that we want to position our e-commerce site against at all. We have our own niche and our reason that our customers shop on our e-commerce platform, and that is not not against Amazon, two very separate entities. I think in the terms of our advertising uh, and media relations partnerships and things, then yeah, Amazon definitely have some partnerships with, with brands that we're envious of, but we do approach things a little bit differently. We're not just about, you know, if you're a brand, you know, drive, using Amazon to drive users to your Amazon store. We're about actually opening up that and saying, well, look, our consumers can actually interact with you directly as well. So they can add to your database. Yeah. Do you think there's like a, an objectivity to what you do that means that your users trust you more than they might a brand? 
Um, I think a lot of what we're doing now with lead generation and, and some of the brands that we partner with certainly adds credibility to what we do because we're not just an e-commerce Thanks for platform. listening to the B2C lead generation Bringing podcast. other tier one brands to our users that maybe they Be don't sure see through other sure to subscribe to hear more from those at the very cutting edge of the lead generation. All your offers exclusive to each brand as well that are on there, or is it? No. To be, to be really frank, we, we make sure that the offers that we run are always joint best in market. So you cannot go somewhere else and get it cheaper. It doesn't make, doesn't make sense when we're working with a brand if the customer then went to them directly and cut us out that it, it, it become cheaper. It's, it's a distorted message. It's not good for the brand. It's not good for us. It's not mm. good for the customer. Uh, but the brands that benefit most from us make sure that either we do have an exclusive or that we are quick off the post with that best in the market. So we're getting the messaging to the user as soon as it hits. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, is there ever a temptation to sort of, you, talk, you talked a bit earlier about the rules and making sure that people are only getting the content you think that they want, but is there ever a temptation to sort of break those rules and think, oh, do you know what, let's, let's send this offer out to a few people just to sort of see whether they're interested or not? Or do you have so, to be quite strict with that? Re repeat that again, Daniel? Sorry, is that, have I, have I, have I cut out? Or? No, 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 I think I just missed one word is all, the connection was fine. Um, so, you know, you were saying that you had to have quite strict rules about who you're sending the offers to, but is there ever a temptation to kind of break that and send it out to a sort of slightly bigger audience um, just to sort of see if you do get people who are interested that you may, you know, to test it and see whether someone else might be interested in something? All the time. Absolutely mm. always. Rules, I think, are very much made to be broken. And, you know, rules are changing continu continuously as well. Just because something worked three weeks ago doesn't mean that it's always going to work now. It's a bit like we were talking about our marketing strategies a minute ago. I think everything just has to be constantly up for review. And that's part of what makes us entrepreneurial and successful is the fact that we're not scared to make a mistake, I suppose. And a lot of our partners understand that as well. And a lot of our partners, they want the mass reach. Some partners want to go very direct and they want to reach just users that are interested in fitness, that have engaged with baby products over the past 90 days. But other brands are, you know, want to reach everyone. They're more about amplifying that voice to as many users as they can. I think you're seeing that change across media at the moment. Uh, TV, great example of it. They're going much more uh, kind of digital-esque in a way that right now some of the adverts I see on TV will be very different from what you see because Sky or Virgin or whatever have tapped into the data underneath it that allows them to go, well, this household is interested in cleaning products. This household is interested in tech. And that's, that's something that's really emerging at the moment. I think over time you'll see all media, you know, outside of print and billboard and such like that, becoming much more personalized, including ourselves. That's very much the end game, I think. But in its current format, there's still a lot of mass marketing that goes on. What's um? Do you work on a CPC, CPL, CPA, like every metric, or is it? You name it, we're active in it. Yeah, and they, that's constant all the time, just going out like different messages per these segments, and you just work on different metrics, and there'll be different offers constantly. Yeah, and for us, it's it, it's about what's what's working for the partner, what's working for the user as well. And I think you know, long gone are the days where you just worked in one format. You have to be flexible because every partner has a different set of KPIs, and that's one of our first questions when we're having a kickoff call with someone: is what are you looking to achieve from this? What are your KPIs for this partnership over the next thirty days, sixty days, ninety days? Because then we will tailor what we're trying to do to hit them targets that you're setting. And do you run like banner ads to your the same users as well? So using retargeting, so like based on offers. So it could be like the email offers going out, and then you can actually hit them with the banner as well, where they're potentially searching elsewhere. Um, so we don't do that for display networks. We do that kind of within our own ecosystem. So it yeah. may be that you come on Go Groupie or, or Discount Experts, and you see a follow up banner, or you might receive a follow up campaign, push notification, something around that. In the future, we're looking at outside of our ecosystem and using Google Display Network and lots of other things to be able to interact. But right now, we're trying to keep it in-house because there is a slight conflict there with brands. You know, A lot of brands out there, they don't like the PPC side of things because they worry that you're going to compete and push up their bid price. So that's something that we're aware of, we're looking at, but not actively engaged in right now. 
So that's what a lot of lead generators will do, right? Um, especially when they work with brands. But we, I got asked about it um, for one of our clients the other day who said, can we bid on their brand with a page we're going to create to drive them leads? And I was like, nice. I'm not even going to ask but people them. Because, still do. <laughs> yeah, they do, yeah. Um, but the problem is if you're the brand, you're just sort of getting a bit hijacked, aren't you? And, um, you know, you suddenly your ad is displaced by something that's going to you anyway. And the, the thing, it highlights two things. So one, that it happens, but the other is that um, if you, and it comes back to what we were talking about, like landing pages and driving traffic to like conversion-based um, design, if you like. If you're a lead generator or someone that understands what's more likely to make people convert, you could pretty much out-compete most brands for their own traffic because you could just bid on it and you just get an extra 5% conversion that covers the cost of the PPC potential, whatever it is that you're using. Um, yeah, you, you do see it. I agree. And it's it's not where we want to position ourselves, you know, mm. really. We, we, we're we about long term and we want our partners to be happy because, to be honest, look, I'm a lazy git. If you're a happy partner, you're more likely to go again and again and again. If I'm all of a sudden bidding on your brand name and I'm driving up your costs, you're not going to want to work with me again. No. So it's, it's very simple. And we've tried to design the way that we kind of deal with our media partnerships and, and our lead generation in the way that we like to buy media because we buy so much of it on the e-commerce side. I think in terms of the landing page, you're, you're so right. And there's so many brands out there that we work with and that approach us that maybe aren't optimizing what we're sending them. And there's huge benefits of them working with the likes of yourselves to you know, customize that page, actually get more for the lead gen, but it is still their responsibility to follow yeah. up with that customer and achieve that LTV. I think it's something that we've spoken about. Um, it's very kind of you to say that, by the way, working with us. So, uh, But no, it's something we've spoken about, which is um, what can happen is the brands get so sort of wrapped up in the brand guidelines and it becomes like a sales and versus marketing thing where it's like, okay, we want the leads or the sale or whatever, but we don't have to put this messaging on there or put this image on there because we want to keep it the brand, even though the brand isn't the thing that's actually going to make users convert. So we get it all the time. Um, and like exactly like you said earlier, you don't really get it with the smaller companies because they're very agile and they'll just shift like that. It's with bigger companies where there's huge compliance and sign-off processes that have to follow, not only the data they capture, which everybody does, um, but the design that users see and stuff. And yeah, they, they sort of can miss opportunities, I think, as a result. Absolutely. And it, it still astonishes me how many people have a lack of visibility once a lead is generated hmm. of, of what's actually happening. We work with uh, a tier one brand that you'll see on your TV every single day of the week. Uh, and we were speaking to them yesterday and they were talking about kicks of X, signups of Y and all being pretty happy. How do we increase it? But what they didn't know that we asked them is actually what's happening with that customer once they've signed up. So what's the true value of that user? Because they're yeah. just lumping them all into a bucket, no matter what the, where the source is, and saying, well, this is roughly what's going on. Now, with us on our, our e-commerce side, that's absolutely not the way we operate. We know exactly where these customers have come from, fair enough, all anonymized and things like that. But we know what they're doing, and we know what they're worth, and how to engage with them. We, we treat them all individually. And I think that's such a missed opportunity for major companies out there that aren't looking at that right now. Yeah. It's all to do with the intent of the user, right? So um, I've had, we've had exactly the same thing. So one of our clients will buy, um, let's say they're working across 10 different channels. So one could be GoGroupy and they're generating leads. One could be Facebook. One could be Google. They're working with co-reg companies. They're doing whatever. Um, and they'll either do one of two things they shouldn't either group everything together so to them it's just all leads regardless of source and there's no differentiation they just look at the overall conversion rate which is really bad um because you don't really know then where to place more of your budget you're just spreading it everywhere thinking oh, everything works or doesn't but the other is um all lumping type together so lumping like certain facebook ads when they've got several mm -hmm. running together lumping all um publishers together under a single affiliate network but actually, if you go into the granular detail, that's where the devil is. It's where you spot what's working, what isn't. You can't run everything together at all. No, I agree. And look, from our side, we want to know what's happening. 
because if it's not working we don't want to keep repeating it we want to fix it and make it work then you're happy you're more likely to do more it's going to engage with our customers more and everything else uh, that feedback for us is really important and it's quite frustrating when you have a partner that's like oh yeah i think it's working here's just a blank check keep going hmm. Yeah. I mean, look, most people, that's great to hear, right? But for us, because we're, we're thinking about engagement, we're thinking about lifetime partnerships, lifetime value and things, the more feedback we get, the better. And sometimes that feedback's not good feedback. Sometimes you get feedback that this campaign flopped. These users signed up, but they didn't engage. Fine. Why is that? Can we change it? Can we make it better? Can we make it work for you? Often the answer is yes. So why do you think it is that they can't feed that information back? Like we said before, I think there's a lack of visibility a lot, a lot of people have. I think their leads come in and they don't know what the value is of that user because they're getting users from social. They're getting users from several different partners and media purchasing. But that's all coming in together and they don't know what's happening after that. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's something we know about. Obviously, but it's like they just have the system is in place to be able to categorize um, like performance by source or channel, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So um, finally, well, I can't say finally, but what I always ask at the end, um, Ben, is just just the opportunity to sort of say, uh, and I guess as well, you are a relatively new company. So since we last spoke, things are probably, you know, that's a, a probably a significant period of your your life as, as a company. And things may have changed even since then. But what do you think, um, what are your next plans for, for NetRev and, you know, where are you hoping to go in this coming year? Yeah, I think that's an interesting one because Go Groupy is not a new company. You know, it's 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 ten years old now. Yes, we still run with a startup mentality, if you like, but it's it's been around for a while and it's seen the industry massively change. NetRev is is definitely new. It's a, a an idea of more kind of a brand agnostic approach for lead generation for advertisers to reach more users, since it's more about the user detail than it is the brand. Um, and these companies, Go Groupie, Discount Experts, and you know, we look to acquire more that will have similar customers um, to them. They're all about leveraging the the group size as opposed to the individual brand size to meet, you know, for the partners to actually reach the users that they're looking for. I suppose at scale, that that's that's what we're looking to do. I think COVID was 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 hard to us because when we started this. We started NetRev as a travel partnership. We were working with all the big travel brands to drive our customers to save on their products. And we weren't interested in any other vertical to begin with. That was our sole focus. And of course, wiped us out overnight. I think we did our first trade show three weeks before lockdown, shaking everyone's hand, thinking everything was fine, um, you know, even hugging people as well. And of course, look, it, the world changed and we lost that part of our business or at least put it on ice. Uh, but within four weeks, we came back up and started working in all these other verticals. So I think going into the rest of this year and, and certainly into next, we'd love to bring travel back. We want to see that industry, which is so close to our heart, get back on its feet and really prosper again. I think from, from the other side of our business, we're looking to potentially enter new markets. Uh, we're looking at growing quite rapidly there. We've had a great last year. Um, so yeah, look, bring it on. For us, it's all about reaching more users, it, it, getting our message out to more people. And that's both for the side of our e-commerce, look, we've got great savings. And then from the side of our net rev, it's, it's talking to more brands and saying, look, we've got this big reach and we want to help you reach these customers. I think it's really interesting how you were just able to pivot so quickly from travel um, or within a year, let's say, or a few months to like bring the company up to what would have been a massive loss by just exploring other opportunities. And it's interesting that you probably would never have done that, right? I think it was on our roadmap, but nowhere near that quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, to have to do everything kind of, you know, within a couple of weeks was definitely not what we imagined, nor what we wanted. Uh, definitely a few gray hairs and things come from that, but look, you know, we, we live and we learn luckily and we just carry on. Yeah. Brilliant. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm confident this time we've got all the information and we've got it recorded safely so we can put it out there. And we felt bad last time that we couldn't um, get a lot of this stuff out there because of the quality. But yeah, we think definitely people will want to listen to this. So it's great that we can actually redo it and 
have people listening and understand what you know all this great stuff you've said so thank you so much for joining us ben and um yeah it's been yeah great. cheers ben thanks for that been great uh, ple- pleasure thank chats thank you very much Bye. thanks for listening to the b2c lead generation podcast the show for serious lead generators be sure to hit subscribe to hear more from those at the very cutting edge of the lead gen world